All right, let's go ahead and get started today. Uh, we have uh, a couple things to uh, finish up with the end of the Middle Ages, and uh, Lord willing, we'll start on Tuesday with the Reformation. Um, but we're already starting to see, and we'll see some things as we uh, go through today, some of the uh, things that are moving towards the Reformation. The Reformation just doesn't appear out of nowhere. But, but instead is a product of several different changes that are going on uh, throughout the latter part of the, the Middle Ages. Uh, before we get to uh, some doctrines and some practices related to that, uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, about some of the last things related to the spread of Christianity. We finished up on Tuesday by talking about how Christianity was very much connected and interwoven with desires for exploration, conquest and colonization when it came to Spain. Uh, and we talked about that uh, in a variety of ways, uh, both through some of their policies and through missionary activities of uh, Spanish missionaries, uh, particularly the Franciscans, but there were, um, there were other um, religious groups going out there as well. And of course, Spain wasn't the only kingdom um, out there trying to search for uh, God, glory, and gold, not always in that order. Portugal was also out there as well, and uh, went, through, uh, went to a variety of places. Uh, of course, uh, the Americas, also Portugal, especially in this uh, later Middle Ages, early modern time period, was also involved in going to uh, Africa. And so, one of the things about the African missions and, and colonization was largely to try and find trade routes to the Far East, to China especially, without having to go through Muslim-controlled lands. Remember that at this point, Islam, Muslims control a large portion of the Middle East. Um, they also control uh, lands that were predominantly at one point part of the Byzantine Empire. But with that as well, is there's this, this concern or this, this hope that in going through Africa, which is still under Muslim control at the time, um, that maybe there is some sort of a crusade that could be taken here as well and, and take those lands from Muslim control. But as we get through the 1500s into the 1600s, um, the greater concern becomes, uh, in, in going through Africa, not so much the evangelization of Africa as it is the use of slave labor. Uh, and so Africa becomes more important as a, as a place not to be colonized, but as a place to um, take people to other places to work as slaves. Africa wasn't the only place that Portugal was interested in. Uh, it also um, sent explorers to places like India, China, and other places throughout the Far East. And with that, of course, missionaries often went with those explorers. Two of the most famous uh, of this time from Portugal as missionaries were Francis Xavier and Matteo Ricci. Xavier becomes so well known as a missionary that he is one that is held in high regard and, and remembered among Catholics. One of the things that Xavier focused on, as several of the missionaries did, was instead of going to the adults of these societies, they often focused on teaching children. And through children, the hope was that you would then reach the parents and the other adults. So by teaching them songs that they would then go home and be singing, uh, teaching them uh, other types of mnemonic devices that could be easily repeated and that um, children would repeat. But with Xavier, of course, not only is there the missionary impulse, but the power of the Portuguese empire. Xavier, in his work, largely has success among the lower castes 
of particularly the society in India. India at the time, and even to the present, was very socially stratified into a caste system, uh, you know, a, a class system, where the lower people in society were stuck in those castes by birth due to what they had done in their previous life. Right? So a lot of the Indian religions believe in reincarnation. Right? And so what you did in your previous life determines what station in life you are in now. And so if you're in the lower castes, right, you're in the dregs of society, you're there because you deserve to be. And so there's no impulse to try and help people on the lower rungs of society achieve any sort of success. Well, these were the people that were most welcome to the Christian message that kind of eliminated classes, that offered salvation, offered hope in this life that was independent of your station in society. But as Christians became, like Xavier, became successful with these lower castes, they often found opposition from the higher castes because of the connection between Christianity and these lower castes. And so Xavier has problems from Indian society from the upper levels. But then he also has problems from the Portuguese military because they're concerned that these conversions are going to affect their trade. Because if you are connecting us with these lower classes, the upper classes that have the control of trade aren't going to be as interested in trading with us. Xavier will eventually travel to uh, places like Japan and have some sex, success uh, establishing... <laughs> <laughs> He's a priest, he spelled it. <laughs> he will have some success there as well. All right, how far do I have to edit the video? <laughs> <laughs> Email from the online people. There's a jump. <laughs> Ten minutes into it, but there was something missing there. <laughs> so he's successful for a while, but after Xavier leaves, the church in Japan, the Christians in Japan, face a lot of persecution from outsiders. And it causes, essentially, Christianity in Japan almost to... Uh, entirely disappeared. Uh, and there have been various attempts uh, from that, those centuries on to try and establish Christianity in Japan to greater and lesser success. Uh, Xavier also attempted to um, go to China uh, to evangelize. But China has always been, uh, and, and even still today to some extent, to some extent um, suspicious of outsiders for various reasons. Uh, in more modern times, it has to do with Westerners and the, the, the corruption they, they believe Westerners will bring on their society. But at the time, of course, it's just a general suspicion of outsiders. And so Xavier is not really able to do much missionary work in China. <laughs> a lot of the missions of the Portuguese were very similar to the Spanish and that they would try to give them European names, encourage them to the converts to wear European modes of dress, uh, adopt other types of habits that were European. So the idea is make them European and Christian. Another uh, successful Portuguese missionary is a man named Matteo Ricci. He was a Jesuit. We'll talk about the Jesuits when we talk about the Reformation because they kind of come up more there. Um, but he too had gone to China and he had some success. Largely, Ricci had decided that one of the things he's going to do is attempt to learn the Chinese culture and language and gradually move in from the outskirts of Chinese society into uh, some of those other levels. That earned him some respect, but a lot of his rights were still restricted. He was able to gain some success in uh, areas where he attempted to join Western philosophy 
with Chinese literary traditions. So, for example, he writes on friendship. He writes a, a work on friendship. And in it, he kind of combines some things from Chinese culture and Western philosophy. And so that intrigues some of the Chinese scholars, and they come to see him. Uh, he's invited to the imperial court to discuss astronomy. Largely, though, he keeps his audiences small and, and doesn't try to build church buildings. His, his assumption is that instead of trying a large-scale missionary project, to work smaller, and then perhaps that will cause the opposition to outsiders to not be as great. But one of the things that Ricci and other missionaries to the East, to places like China and Japan, are these concerns about practices like ancestor worship or ancestor veneration. And whether such activities are idolatrous or not, should they be discouraging Chinese converts from venerating their ancestors? And if so, what's that going to do to the effectiveness of their evangelizing? You know, is this really uh, something, are they really worshipping their ancestors in an idolatrous way? Or is it a veneration, a respect for? Um, and so that's one of the things that Chinese missions uh, have faced uh, as well, especially those early ones. The Portuguese Empire, of course, extended the other way as well into the Americas, uh, to places like Brazil, the Portuguese importing slaves from Africa to help with trade. And because of that, there were some cases of missionaries being at odds with the colonizing forces because of some of the ways these slaves were treated, uh, mistreated, often very cruelly. Other mission missionaries, however, took the opportunities that um, the power of Portuguese military provided them. And just like in Spain, in New Spain, the Portuguese often found uh, success in trying to hybridize the traditions of the indigenous peoples with Christianity, right? and so making uh, connections there. But ultimately, one of the things that Christians faced, especially in these beginning travels to the Americas, were some questions of theological concern. Who were these people that they were encountering in the Americas? They're not described in the Bible. So if the Bible is, is truth, then how do we understand where these people came from? Additionally, other people began to speculate. Well, the Bible says that the apostles preached to the whole world. Now, I believe that is the, their known world, right? So the Roman Empire, you know, regions they would have known. But for these people in an early modern period, the apostles preached throughout the whole world was it possible an apostle had gotten to the Americas? And some people thought they, they had. <coughs> what about the previous generations between the time of the cross and the time of the 15th century who had never heard the gospel? Were they damned in hell? Because no missionaries had ever gone to that, right? So there's a lot of religious questions that colonization brought to the, 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 the minds of missionaries, trying to understand how these Native Americans could fit in with um, their, under, their, their understanding shaped by the biblical worldview. Some of them ultimately decided that Native Americans were the lost tribes of Israel. Right? And of course, the, the ten tribes that kind of are, are taken by the Assyrians and then kind of vanish, well, maybe, uh, maybe that's who Native Americans were. So they were talked about in the Bible, but, and of course we know today, because of 
anthropology and other developments in genetics, uh, the, the, there's quite a bit of difference between Native Americans and Jews. Um, you know, we're talking at a time period before all of that, right? So they're trying to find explanations for it that make sense to them in the worldview that they have. Any questions about um, the spread of Christianity, uh, colonization, either what we talked about today or what we were finishing up with on Tuesday? I assume that the belief that the Native Americans were part of the Dinlos tribes was led to gain Mormonism. Yeah, and so it didn't, there wasn't a direct uh, connection, but it, it does show that even though Mormons claimed something similar, um, that it, it wasn't an unusual view. Right? And so people, other people had said something similar uh, that we would say are more orthodox Christians than uh, what you see in, in something like Mormonism. Right? So it's not something out of the blue. Other questions? 